Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books in Jewish Studies and Biblical Studies, both channels of the New Books Network. I am Rachel Edelman, Professor of Hebrew Bible at Hebrew College in Boston. I'm your host for today. And I have invited uh, Rhiannon Grable, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Rhodes College. We're going to be talking about her new book, Texts After Terror, published by Oxford University Press in 2021. But first, a little intro to Professor Graybill, whose work brings together biblical texts and contemporary critical and cultural theory. Her research interests include prophecy, gender and sexuality, horror theory, speculative fiction, and the Bible as literature. She is the author of the book called Are We Not Men? Unstable Masculinity in the Hebrew Bible, in the Hebrew Prophets, uh, also published by Oxford in 2016. And most recently, Texts After Terror, Rape, Sexual Violence, and the Hebrew Bible. She has also co-edited three books, Rape, Culture, and Religious Studies, Uh, The Bible, Gender and Sexuality, Critical Readings, and Who Knows What We Make of It If We Ever Got Our Hands on It, The Bible and Margaret Atwood, really interesting collections of essays. So our current project, her current projects include the Anchor Yale Bible Commentary on Jonah with Stephen McKenzie and John Kultner and an edited volume entitled Lee Edelman and the Queer Study of Religion. So really fascinating and quirky work, I think. So uh, what drew you to your topic for this book, Text After Terror? So what got me thinking about sexual violence in the Bible was really the experience of teaching at a liberal arts college and teaching undergraduate students and both teaching them, so we had a required Bible sequence at Rhodes, the college where I teach. So teaching the Bible to these students and then also hearing about their experiences of sexual violence on campus, reading about, advocating about, working on the whole problem of campus sexual assault, and really feeling like the way that we talked about rape in the Bible just was old fashioned. It had some great, it had a great sort of feminist foundation, but a lot of it wasn't clicking with the students and felt like it was not engaging with the way that we talk about sexual violence. And so my first book, which you mentioned, Are We Not Men, was about masculinity, in part because I felt like as a feminist biblical scholar who was also a woman, I wanted to put the men, um, I wanted to put the spotlight on masculinity and problematize that. But then I I was sort of thinking, growing out of that interest in gender, and I felt like I really needed to write about sexual violence. So it had started as a book about women more broadly, but as you know, there's so much rape in the Bible, I was able to narrow it down. But it was really my students that got me thinking about this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fascinating. So your title suggests a direct engagement with Phyllis Tribble's foundational work, Texts of Terror, first published in 1984, almost 40 years ago. I owe my own close reading strategy and feminist biblical sensibility to her acute, careful analysis. It was really the first serious feminist analysis of biblical texts, yet it still feels as raw and as radical as yesterday. Can we justifiably, as feminist scholars, say, we've come a long way, baby, right? Um, Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so what do we mean by texts after terror? So I love Phyllis Tribble also, and I love her work, and I think it it did so much for our field, and it's amazing how how good it still is. You know, I teach that article, Depatriarchalizing in Biblical Interpretation, which is 1973, and I keep waiting for the students to call it out, and they love it every time. And, like, that article is great. Texts of Terror is also great. So in calling my book Texts After Terror, I very much mean the after in the sense of building on or in tribute to, right? So it's not that Tribble's paradigm is a bad paradigm. It's thinking about how we as this generation of feminist biblical scholars can pay homage to and then also build on that foundational feminist work. So that's really what I'm thinking about. 
The other thing though, is I think that there's a way that Tribble's book gets used by non-feminist biblical scholars. Like you can name check texts of terror and then that covers your feminist bases and you can leave the feminist to like feel sad and you can go do your historical critical thing about the rape of Dina or whatever. And so I'm interested also in in connecting with the conversation with Tribble, but also building on her work and kind of continuing that genealogy. I'm also interested in a feminist project where we can think about different ways of feeling about different texts. So one thing I found myself thinking about is compulsory affects, which is how I would describe this idea that as feminists, we're supposed to feel a certain way about stories. So partly, Tribble is such a beautiful writer, you really get sucked into thinking in the way that she's thinking in those categories in the book. And I think it's really powerful, but I also think that feminist scholarship should be able to do things besides just perform grief or memorialize suffering. And so like she has those, um, you remember in the book, she has pictures of tombstones, right? Of the women who are murdered, which is so powerful. But also I think the book kind of casts a shadow and has limited the way that we think about these stories. So we feel like we can only say the same thing that Tribble already said, but in a less poetic, sort of less evocative way. So I wanted to think about like expanding the Tribble universe. So all that sort of goes into after. And I wanted to think about an after to trauma also. So one thing with those tombstones is she has tombstones for four women. It's um, Tamar, Hagar, Jeff's daughter, and the Levite's concubine. But two of those women die, and two of those women don't die in the text. And I, I think that that is a really important distinction. So I want to think about also the possibility of afterlives and after stories, even for characters that have great suffering. Excellent, excellent. I also think you you do an excellent job at problematizing the category of victim and thinking differently about agency vis-a-vis rape. Um, You know, uh, the other great feminist scholar who I'm a fan of is is Tikva Frimmer-Kensky. And she has this category called victims. And she places all the rape victims in that category, victims. And I think you say, well, let's rethink that. Let's rethink what it means to be a rape victim and think about the subjectivity and reclaiming subjectivity without um, voicing over. So I want you to talk about what it, what does it mean? You, you introduce really a fantastic uh, categ- concept calling called refusing innocence. So tell me what that means to you and where you apply it. In the case of a rape victim, for example. Yeah, so this language of victim is so, it's so powerful, but it's so tricky. And this is part of, too, what sort of got me entangled in this project was teaching this feminist scholarship that talks about victims of rape and this really sort of, can you imagine such a terrible thing? Who can imagine the way the victim feels? And then teaching it to these students and knowing, right, we know one in five college students, female college students, experience a sexual assault. So it started to feel like this feminist gesture that was actually very othering to the people that I was talking about, talking to. Right. So that was part of it. I've also learned a lot from, just from talking to survivors, reading accounts by survivors, right? There's this debate over, do we say victims or do we say survivors? I use this sort of intentionally awkward victim slash survivor in the book in part because both of those terms have been critiqued by people as erasing their experience. So victim is a term that feels disempowering. It feels like you don't have any agency. Survivor can feel like you have overcome a trauma and it's no longer affecting you. So there's been some pretty strong critiques of survivor language too. Mm -hmm. So I try to kind of stay with that messiness. I think the thing about innocence, so I talk about refusing a position of innocence. And for me, I link this idea to Donna Haraway, who's a feminist Um, philosopher. She started in history of science or as a biologist, actually. And it's a common idea in a lot of feminist thought, right? Feminist standpoint, epistemology. There's no neutral point from which you can approach things. There's no kind of like innocent, objective subject position, but also we're all already implicated in our relationships and in positionality and in the partial view that we bring to things. And so I think that Refusing a position of innocence means sort of a position of humility as interpreters and also openness to other people's different positions. I might want the language of victim. You might want the language of survivor. We should both sort of hold space for each other to have different perspectives. 
But I also think it's linked to this desire to have innocent victims. And so we all know about the kind of script of the way a rape victim ought to be, right? Like she is white, she is pretty, she is either single or she has a very nice chase boyfriend. She's walking home from the party and the evil rapist jumps out of the bushes, right? And, or drugs her drink or something. And we have these kind of scripts of, of innocence and how you ought to be to be a victim. And a lot of victims and survivors have talked about how, um, administrative or legal processes like the Title IX process at universities or the process of getting a rape kit, those processes are re-victimizing and gaslighting because they blame victims or survivors for not being innocent or perfect kind of victims. I think this language of innocence and purity is another kind of related discourse can be really harmful and also intellectually limiting. And so that's why I wanted to sort of push back and refuse that position of innocence. And that's why that's the first kind of interpretive position that I name in the, the framing of the book. Okay. So can you tell me how you apply that to, let's say, the story of Dina or Lot's daughters or, yeah, tell me, yeah. tell so me the application. I think we really want going in, we want Dina to be innocent. We want Dina to be the victim. We want to be able to identify with Dina. And whenever you bring up a reading, for example, that Dina, so Musa Dube, who's a post-colonialist feminist scholar, says that Dina is a colonizer, right? She comes to the land. You've got this story with the um, the white or the ethnic, the position of identity woman and the foreign man who's represented as a rapist. And you start to see the parallels to something like um, the way that Ida B. Wells talked about lynching and the threat of the rape to the white woman. And then you feel really icky as an interpreter because you just want to feel like Dina is a victim with this bad man, right? And so I think that's a good example of a story where resisting innocence means just sort of holding back and holding space for both of those possibilities. Mm. It means taking seriously the way that the text, I think, suggests rape, but you can't unambiguously say that that's what happens. And we have strong interpretive traditions on both sides. I mean, Lot's Daughters is another one. People don't like to talk about that as much in rape stories, in part just because it's a really icky story, right? Somebody's a victim, but is it Lot? Is it his daughters? Is it everybody? I've noticed recently an interpretive move when I teach the text, I don't know if you've seen this in your students, they want to blame the older daughter and then the younger daughter gets to be the perfect victim because she got tricked by her older sister. But there's this real desire to have some good person that we can unambiguously identify as innocent. And I think that we need to resist that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, with Lutz daughters, I've always, uh, I, I was once surprised by one of my students saying, uh, this is just a cover for father, daughter, incest, rape. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's a real, it's a mistelling uh, of it as a seduction story um, where they get him drunk. And um, the other way of reading it is saying that this is retaliation. Uh, he offered those two virgin daughters up to the mob to be gang raped by them. And then, you know, there's this divine inter intervention, deus ex machina, and then um, they quid pro quo say, okay, you offered us up, we're gonna, you know, now that we're, we think we're the only survivors in the world, we're gonna, we're gonna seduce you in a cave. But it's, it is icky, right? <laughs> it's definitely an icky, messy story. So that might, this leads me to my, um, my next question. You deploy these terms, fuzzy, messy, and icky, and wonderfully familiar and defamiliar ways, defamiliarizing ways. Um, and I want I, I want to ask you about that language. Um, where 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 are you coming from? How are you defining the terms uh, fuzzy, messy, and icky? So I really wanted to use terms that were not already established scholarly terms, and I wanted terms that came from everyday language and the way that we talk to each other. And in part, one thing that consistently interests me is how the informal ways that we talk to each other about experiences of sexual violence or rape culture, especially when we don't want it to rise to official actionable levels. And so one thing you notice as a female scholar, like at our disciplinary meeting, for example, is there's a way that we sometimes communicate to each other about, for example, 
people in the field that you should be careful around. And we use this sort of coded language that's also very clear. And so I'm interested, that was sort of informing me in thinking about this. So I also wanted to think about really like what the language we use about sexual violence was missing. So I settled on these three terms, fuzzy, messy, and icky. So fuzzy is a way of talking about fuzzy memories, the way that trauma interferes with our memories, the way that sometimes you have an experience and it's not until later when you're describing it to someone else as a funny story that you realize that, oh, like that was actually really messed up. And there's this kind of later sort of processing or putting your experience into categories later. Fuzzy to me also is a way of signaling or talking about the way that alcohol is often involved in sexual mm. violence, which is something that we know, but often don't want to talk about, especially like in official context. I mean, Lot's Daughters is a good example of that in the biblical story or Noah and Ham, but thinking about fuzzy, other reasons our memories can be fuzzy. Messy is a way of thinking or naming the consequences of sexual violence and the way that they sort of spiral out and aren't just limited to a specific scene or situation. I also am interested in the way that the term messy or hot mess or she's a mess is applied to women and gay men as a way of sort of showing a, a person that's out of control, that's not following gender scripts, it's sort of just bringing disruptive energy. And then icky is the one I've gotten the most pushback on, but I also think it's the most useful. I wanted a way of talking about creepy, sketchy. There are all kinds of vernacular words we use for this. A, a way for carving out space between official language of rape or sexual misconduct or something like that. And sort of just naming the way that that's experienced as well as the kind of ambiguity around a lot of experience. So something like Cat Person, which is this short story by Kristen Rapinian that came out in the New Yorker, I think in December, 2016 and went viral immediately. It's just a story about icky, bad sex. When it came out, a lot of people thought it was nonfiction. There was this whole kind of explosion, like Americans can't read anymore because, but it was because it so viscerally captured this experience that so many of us have had. And I think icky is really like the best word to describe that. And a lot of other things like stories in the Bible. Yeah, actually, after you talked about that at the SBL conference in the fall, I went and read it. I hadn't read it before. And it really is creepy because there is this question, it, he he uh, stalks her afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, it felt very familiar. I, I'm I, I'm not surprised that they didn't think that people who read it didn't thought it was nonfiction because it feels very real. Uh, it's mm -hmm. very yeah. There's the part where she he's inviting her back to his house and she wonders if he's going to murder her, but decides it would be impolite to object. And she can't figure out if he has a cat or it's just, it captures that affect really well. And it's just, it's such an icky story, but so good. <laughs> yeah. Very well written. Um, so, so um, I want to think about the edges of consent. Um, another interesting category. So I understand that with regard to Dina, uh, how, how there's a lot of controversy about whether we call this rape or whether we call this debasement or whether she even had the right to refuse, right? Um, so she was under the aegis of her father. Um, does does consent as a category even make sense with regard, regard to biblical daughters? And this is a particularly of interest to me because I'm writing a book called Daughters in Danger in the Hebrew Bible from, um, yeah, from the Hebrew Bible to modern Midrash. And, um, and the question of consent is, is, is a really interesting one. Can we apply the category of subjectivity? And I think you reclaim the category of sub subjectivity and you want to insist on yes, but. Uh, so help me, help me navigate that um, and think of, uh, help me um, uh, see what your reading strategy is when you're looking at these, uh, Tamar and Dina and the question of consent. Mm 
I think you're absolutely right that I want to hold on to subjectivity, but I want to push back against consent. And part of this is also when I started working on the book, so like 2016, 2017, consent was really, really white hot as how we were going to solve campus sexual violence. And so there were all of these, you may have seen a YouTube video, consent is like tea. If you offer someone tea and they don't want, they can say yes, they can say, there were all these kind of infographics. There was this idea especially among college administrators and people that weren't actually familiar with how sexual violence necessarily played out, that if we just taught students what consent was, this would solve sexual violence. And so there were things like consent apps where like if we were about to have sex, you could consent on video on the app. And then if you retracted your consent, I would have video evidence that you had consented, right? Which is a horrible, horrible way to think about <laughs> sexual violence. <laughs> and so I got really interested in thinking about why consent was such a problem. And so so in the book, I talk about some of the limits of consent, right? It assumes a certain kind of enlightenment model of the subject. It assumes that people always know what they want. It assumes that people always do what is in their best interest. It assumes that people always have a good option available to them. So it doesn't look at all the situations where we consent to things that are not in our interest or that we don't want because we don't really have a full spectrum of choice. And then there's the classic, you know, post-colonial disability crip critique, right? It's only certain people and certain bodies are allowed to consent. And so, and then there's also just the fact that consent is a low bar. So to say that you had sex that was consensual is, I mean, if the best you can say about your sex is it's consensual, like that's a pretty limited view of sexual possibility, right? And so I, I was interested in thinking about this feminist and queer critique of consent and how it could help us think about biblical texts. And really my focus is that consent is not useful ultimately as a way of assessing whether or not there is violence or suffering or injustice done in a biblical text, right? Consent is not, it also would be really nice if you could just be like, well, did she consent or not? That will solve this text. And so Tamar is an example of a story, right? So she says, no, don't do this. But then she also says, ask my father first, which to us, like, that's another thing that's really icky. You're like, no, no, don't go there, right? But it, it's complicating. And it, it's giving us an example of a situation where, you, the options that are available to you are not good options. And so what does consent mean in that kind of situation? I think it's also convenient that many of our stories about biblical sexual violence, our female characters don't speak. And so then, and there's this interesting tendency in reception to sort of fill in what they would have said, which is, it's, it's so tempting and it's so compelling. And there are so many beautiful feminist works doing that. But I think that kind of erasure of the moment of speech also means we have to sort of we can't apply a basically verbal contemporary model back on the text so partly i wanted to you show that consent is not the best way to think about these biblical stories and partly i wanted to use the biblical stories to show how maybe consent isn't the only way we should think about sex in our contemporary period uh -huh, really interesting. So the uh, sort of a bivalent or a feedback, right? Let's reconsider consent in the contem contemporary context, and then let's let's see how it doesn't apply in the case of well, Dina, we don't know, and then in the case of Tamar, it Tamar when she says, "Oh, just ask ask Dad first, and he'll let he'll he'll broker the marriage." And, and um, which implies that she would have consented. Um, I don't know. I think I, I, I always think with Tamar when she says that it's such a plea for time. Mm -hmm. And um, in against the greater backdrop of the story, it implicates David, right? David is the one who sends her to her half brother to feed him when he's feigning illness. So David is implicated, right? David is implicated in his own daughter's, uh, you know, rape. Um, and I think it's meant, right? She's the first victim after the episode with Bathsheba with the adultery and then the murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. So, um, you know, it makes sense that the daughter, who's the most precious uh, member of the royal household should then be the first victim. And she's, and David is brought, but virtually brought right in 
right into the, um, you know, to her debasement. And, and at the very end, you know, when, um, when she walks away while wailing, she cries, right? She lets out this really loud cry. Um, and, and her, her brother silences her, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Absalom silences her. And, um, and then she lives as a shomema, it's such a powerful word, a shomema in her brother's house, which brings me to Batsion, which uh, the other daughter that you talk about, um, Zion, who is also shomema, desolate, right? We only use the term shomema with, with regard to land or a city, a devastated city. And so now we have a, a woman who's Shomama, who's, who's de uh, desolate. So tell me about Sion. Tell me about Bat Sion. So the figure, the feminine figure of Bat Sion who appears in Lamentations. And you say this really, and you make this really interesting comment that Sion is um, never actually talks about her rape. It seems to be that she is also a victim of rape, but she never talks about the rape. Why is that important to you that she doesn't describe her? She only, it's the after effects per se. So what does that mean to you that she doesn't talk about it? So one reason she's such a compelling, and I think figure for many of us as feminist readers is because she does speak. And so, right, like I love the way you just described Tamar ending with this sort of nonverbal wailing and then being silenced or silent in the text. And so it's so, the fact that Batzion is speaking and that she has this beautiful poetry, right? It, it feels, so at first there's just this moment of relief, like you have a female voice in the text and that is very powerful. At the same time, it's interesting when you actually look at the content of what she says, there's a very strong, so there's a strong feminist tradition of reading that basically the fact that Daughter Zion speaks back is itself significant. So all that matters is that she speaks. It doesn't actually matter what she says. And I, I understand the impulse behind this reading, but I also think it's ultimately, it's potentially a very patronizing reading because I think it also matters what she says, right? I think we would, many of us would agree that the fact of speaking is important, but also the content of your speech is important. And just to be treated as exemplary because you are able to speak is, it feels like a backhanded kind of compliment. And so it's also interesting when you look at what she actually says, it's in this passage that's saturated with sexual violence, illusions, it's very icky, but all the descriptions of rape and sort of where that, that reading hangs on is not in things that she herself says. And so I'm interested in how this parallels the way that we often want victims or survivors of sexual violence to tell us what happened to them, to tell us how bad it was, and to have a sort of, um, a, there's a certain kind of story that we want survivors to tell, right? We want it to be horrifying. We want to get to feel terrible on their behalf. Hopefully it ends with healing, but maybe also with some kind of, you know, perfect cathartic moment of terribleness at the end. And so this is also something that a lot of survivors have written about, about resisting the, or the need or the demand by others to prove it or to share the worst part of your life experience. So one of the books that really helped me think this through is by Leah Lakshmi Pipejna Samarsinha, who is a queer disability activist. And she has this great book called Care Work that talks about disability justice and talks about that kind of demand to constantly be showing the worst parts of your life and proving that you're truly a victim of trauma or truly disabled and how that is actually a really cruel and unfeminist and damaging kind of demand to put on people. So I thought it was interesting that Daughter Zion in many ways our victim who speaks then refuses to claim that. More broadly, this is related to how she's not a good victim. And so she doesn't act the way that we want survivors of trauma to act. She doesn't protest in the right ways. Like it seems like she's gonna be a good survivor of trauma, but then her, she gets, it gets messy. It doesn't really do what we want it to do. And I think that is actually essential and actually connects much more with many people's lived experiences of sexual violence and the kind of perfect victim script. Yeah. And I think the other thing about Batsiana is she blames herself mm -hmm. to a certain extent, right? And that's 
oh, you shouldn't do that, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. right. Uh, and yet that's her experience. Her experience is I must be at fault. You know, history has gone against me. I was, you know, I was under yeah, Nobody siege. wants a self-hating victim, right? I mean, that's the word. You want your victim to be strong and innocent and not to blame herself. And But many victims do blame themselves and then they feel guilty for that because that's not how a good feminist victim acts. And I, I think it's really powerful that that's what she's doing. We shouldn't minimize it or erase it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, really interesting. Yeah. I think you were um, Mel uh, daughter Zion speaks back. That's uh, Mel. What's her name? Oh, uh, Mandolfo. I think Mandolfo. Yeah. And I love the book. And then at the same time, I said, well, this is could be a closer reading. She's not doing a close reading. And, and uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, reclaiming Reclaiming the voice, but problematizing that voice. I think that 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 was very rich reading. So tell me about Bathsheba. <laughs> um, Bathsheba. Um, so I've also worked a lot with Bathsheba, and I and I I you know I I sort of reparsed her name in a midrashic style that I am a daughter of oaths. I'm thinking about her in terms of oaths. Um, the other person who's worked a lot with. Uh, with Bacheva is Cheryl Exum. And she is one of the ones that, that says overtly, even if we can't say that Bacheva was raped, right? We don't know whether she consented. Again, it's the problematics of consent. We don't know whether she consented to, to lie with King David or not as a married woman. She's raped by the pen effectively. Um, and you sort of untangle that and you say, no, let's, let's, let's revisit this um, and say, well, what, what if she was willing? Um, what if let's, let's make it a fuzzy, you know, uh, ambiguous. Um, so I, I want you to tell me about your take on Bacheva. Like, yeah, yeah, this is so this is another tricky one. And this also, I mean, in many ways, writing this chapter grew out of teaching this story to my students and just, you know, when you close read slowly, so many things just always bubble up and it's not feminist at all, but I think like Sternberg and Perry's reading, like that's a great reading of how power works here of the sort of literary subtlety. And so to me, this really, it really feels pretty rapey, but there are good feminist scholars on both sides, right? So there's a reading of Bathsheba as victimized, as taken. There is a reading that she is in a situation of limited power and she's doing what she can to improve her situation. And there are other kind of readings in between. And so, and try to, instead of picking a side, I found myself wanting to think about how else could we think about harm in this text besides thinking about the question of consent? Because I think also, this is a point that comes up consistently with students. How can you say no to a king, right? The power dynamics are such that it feels like a traditional consent model is just obviously inadequate to the story. Mm -hmm. And so this is where I found, there's a scholar named Joseph Fischel who's written about consent. He has two books. Um, sex and harm in the age of consent and then the second one is a little bit more popular it's called screw consent and he talks about peremption which is the limiting of future possibility and he has this really nice reading of the play and film doubt um, the film is the one with Bill Timur Hoffman and Meryl Streep and it's about yeah, yeah the catholic is it it's about a catholic priest who works at a school and does he or doesn't he sexually assault this child but it, what Fischl draws out really nicely is it's the limiting of possibility in the future for the child. Like that gives us a different way to think about harm besides a kind of binary model. And so I wanted to think about how Bathsheba's future is limited in the kind of preemption of future possibility. I also was interested in thinking about her character at the, so she pops up at a few moments, right? Like it's mostly the rape story, but then You've got this scene with Nathan where he compares her to an animal and that always feels very icky to me, the kind of like reducing her, it's, it's minimizing her subjectivity more. And then she's gone from the text and then she comes back right as David is dying to, you know, get I her son in. I see the parable of the little ewe lamb. Yeah, yeah I find okay. the parable is a little bit, I, I think the parable is doing a problematic thing in fully representing her as a victim and representing yes. her as like an, an animal. And I think that sometimes 
because it aligns with a sort of feminist reading, we end up reading, then we're like, we think we're reading against the text. We're actually reading with the grain of the text and fully reducing her to victim and stripping away any kind of agency throughout mm. her story. So I want to think about her more, more richly. And also think, I mean, she's also a problematic character, right? I mean, the way that she treats Abishag, the way that she, like, she's not a, there's a there's a complexity there that it's easy to erase if you just make her into a passive victim. And so I think thinking about how her future is limited and the kind of harm she experiences and then thinking about that harm as related to the way that trauma plays out, right? Hurt people hurt people is a cliche, but it also lets us think about sort of the ways that harm can spiral out from a particular situation. So I wanted a kind of thicker, richer, more complicated Bathsheba. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's the one that makes sure that Solomon, the son, second son that she conceives with David, is is throned, and she invokes an oath. Yeah, she's set up by Nathan, the prophet, but she's the one who invokes the oath and whisper, you know, reminds David of this supposed oath that uh, he made as a promise to her. And then she sets Ad Adonijah uh, up mm -hmm. to be killed by Solomon. Right, and says, oh, Adonija wants Abishag as a bride. Oh, really? Does he want the throne next? And then off with his head, right? So does she know? And there's this whole question. And, and you know, we can we can invoke um, Perry and uh, Menachem Perry. And, um, yeah. No, Sternberg. Sternberg and Perry, right? Uh, Menachem Sternberg and, and Perry, who, who talk about those ambiguities in the text. Does she know or does she not know the implications of reporting Adonijah's request for Abishag and that it would lead to an execution? So she's she's a smart one. Um, she's potentially very manipulative. Um, and yet I think we need to be careful not to read that um, that we, we have a tendency to read that but that three-dimensional Bacheva back into the mm -hmm. original scene of um, of seeing her bathing on the roof. At the same time, she's she does seem to go with him, right? She goes, she goes, she va um, So there, there is, there is, there is what to work with. Um, I don't think she's a flat character as she's often been described. Um, and I really loved your your unpacking of that. So um, yeah, I I, uh, I I loved your book. I loved uh, I loved um, reading it. It was so rich, really cracked open the biblical text in interesting ways. Um, what about your methodology, right? I want to think about your methodology of using modern. Uh, modern film, contemporary film, modern novels, um, you're not engaged in a historical critical reading, but I think it's still a very careful reading. So um, what is what is the that how would you talk about the method that you're using? So yes, I'm not a traditional historical critical no. scholar. Sometimes people, I once got a critique that my work was historically anachronistic and I was like, yes, like that is the point of what I am doing here. Absolutely. I, Embrace it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I'm interested in how contemporary, so I find literature especially really useful to think with. And I find that literary texts in many ways do things when you put them in conversation with biblical texts. And for me, it's especially literary texts that aren't necessarily specifically about the Bible, but I find that collision between the Bible and contemporary literary texts really illuminating. So um, you mentioned at the beginning, I've worked a lot on Margaret Atwood. And one thing that really struck me when working on this project, I was rereading The Handmaid's Tale because mm -hmm. I was teaching it. And the Handmaid's Tale has become such shorthand for talking about women who are victimized, for talking about rape, you know, wearing a handmaid's costume to go protest is a good way of saying you have no agency because the male religious and political authorities have taken it from you. And Alfred is describing the scene where she is being raped by or having sex with the commander. 
Um, it's this sort of like reenactment of the um, biblical use of sex slaves or handmaids. And she says, I'm not being raped. I didn't have a lot of choice, but I had some, and this is what I chose. And it's specifically dismantling the idea that she was raped. And it's such a tough moment when you're reading because you're like, no, no, you're being raped here. Like, but then you're like, do I have, does she have false consciousness? Am I telling someone how to understand their, so it's like this mm. textual dramatization of the difficulty around experience and sexual violence connected to the biblical text. And I found that really useful to kind of think about the categories. The other thing I was really interested in doing in this book, and here I'm inspired, especially by Sarah Ahmed, who's a queer feminist theorist, whose work I find just really beautiful and generative, was really intentionally thinking with scholars who are not male. So with women and non-binary scholars, I have some queer male thinkers. I mean, there are some male scholars in the book for sure, but I think, and so that is both on the level of theory and also on the kind of literary texts I engage. There's a kind of shadow canon in biblical studies of what sorts of films and literary works you're supposed to bring in conversation with biblical texts. So like you can bring Coen Brothers movies, you can bring certain kinds of, but you can bring the King David report, right? But you're not supposed to bring millennial fiction about icky sex into talking about the Bible. And I wanted to dismantle <laughs> that and also kind of expose that, the sort of unspoken norms in our discipline, right? We know like our field is what, 75% male pretty white. So I wanted to disrupt that. So for example, Carmen Machado, who is a queer Latina fiction and memoirist, her work has been really helpful for me in thinking about this. I mentioned Queering Sexual Violence, which is an anthology by queer and trans survivors of sexual violence. Many of them, people of color, like writing about their experience. So I find those perspectives useful to destabilize the biblical text. I mean, there's always a place for some good little historical critical moment, but I think that if biblical studies is going to say anything interesting about the text and connect with anyone outside of our own little insular field, we it's helpful to look beyond it. I also think for us as feminists and queer scholars, we should be conversing with other feminist and queer work outside of biblical studies, because otherwise we become our own sort of weird little feminist offshoot, and it's not connecting in the same way. Mm. Mm, really nice. So I, I and I, I, I mentioned this point uh, at the SBL conference, but I'll, I'll mention it again here in our in our conversation. What is what do you think of collections of modern midrash like Dear Shuni, written in Hebrew, originally now recently translated into English? So these these Israeli feminist uh, writers are appropriating the biblical text and giving new voice and new interpretations to these, these passages. Um, and the other person I think about is Alicia Jo Rabin's work, Girls in Trouble, the indie rock band. Um, so, so what do you think of that? that? I think it's great. So I, I think that that is such a rich literary practice and feminist practice. And I think that those can also help us see the text in such different ways. In some ways, I feel like when I try to write about those texts, it feels like the literature is doing all of the work. And so I end up just explaining in a way that's less good than what the literary retelling is already doing. But I think it's such an important feminist method for me. So my entry point into that was like growing up in the 80s, like feminist retellings of fairy tales were such a thing at that time, yeah, right? And so, right. you know, taking the evil stepmother or the sister and sort of destabilizing the canonical myth. So I always think back to that. And I think that that is such a rich way of understanding. So Sarah Maitland does a lot of that with fairy tales. She also has a, a beautiful retelling of the Sarah and Hagar story that I talk about really briefly in my book. But so it's not really a part of this project, but I think it's such an interesting approach. My, I'm working, starting to work on a project now about the woman is land and the female body. And I'm using speculative fiction to kind of do some of that thinking. But I think that's maybe a place where some of the midrashic feminist rewritings might also be, be useful. But yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. I That'd wish I had more of it in the book. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so tell me what you're working on now, Rihanna. You, you mentioned this land and, and, and the female body. It, yeah, tell me about it and maybe other projects that 
<laughs> well, the first thing is I've been writing this Jonah commentary forever, not forever, but for almost forever with two of my Rhodes <laughs> colleagues, John Kaltner and Steve McKenzie. And we have the page proofs now, so it should be out this year. So massive Jonah commentary. We also have a short book called What Are They Saying About the Book of Jonah that we have finished up. So two kind of collaborative Jonah projects, more, more historical, although our commentary also talks about things like trauma theory and post-colonial theory and affect theory and spatial theory. So kind of trying to bring a little bit of new energy to the Anchor Bible series. Mm -hmm. And then after I wrote my rate book, I kind of just needed a little time to and space to just sort of recover and think, but I've started, I'm very early, but I've started working on another monograph, which is about reimagining the metaphor of the woman is land and the land is woman and thinking about how we can think about that common biblical metaphor without just reinscribing colonial logics of rape and domination and without just sort of thinking about female bodies as things that give um, pleasure and are dominated by men. And so I've been thinking about some of the texts like in Song of Songs and in the Prophets. And I think I'm going to talk about numbers a lot too, together with some feminist literature, rethinking the body. So for example, there is a short story by Vandana Singh called The Woman Who Thought She Was a Planet about a woman who turns into a planet. It's fantastic. And it's such an interesting way of thinking about Woman as Landa's metaphor is no longer a metaphor because she actually is a planet. Um, and there's a story called Fruiting Bodies by Catherine Harlan about a woman who has mushrooms growing out of her body, which is another kind of like body as garden, but it's this sort of lesbian gothic short story. It's what's like de <laughs> deconstructing the woman's body as garden for male pleasure. There's a Sarah Maitland story about a, a teenage girl who plants the flower garden in her vagina and about what happens and how it grows. And so I'm interested in all these kind of literary texts that touch on the female body as land, but then do something really different with it. So it's very early. And if you have any <laughs> women who turn into trees or plant gardens or do things, please let me know. I'd love to include them. Yeah. But that's what yeah. I'm sort of figuring out now. Yeah. So I, I know the remit or some of the rabbinic. So Gail Leibovitz has talked about uh, the woman as uh, Karka Olam. That's Esther, that she's she's um, in fertile land. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that Gail Leibovitz has a fantastic, fantastic work on on feminine metaphors uh, for land, um, and then and then I have an essay on Shomama on that that idea with Batsion and and Tamar. So um, I think you 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 know that, that piece. Yeah, is that in the feminist journal of feminist studies? Of yeah, religion? GFSR. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. do have that article. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's very rich. It's very rich. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I think about what it means that the punishment is that the land is left fallow for 70 years, comparable to the the not letting the land go um, for the Shemitah, the seven, sabbatical year. Um, you know, what that whole motif is in Jeremiah. Um, so we're excited to see what you do with that. Yeah, it's going to be a while, but I'm ex I'm excited to be working on it. I feel like I'm finally like starting to think again and connect things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, fabulous. Well, thank you so much for joining the New Books Network and for this, your time and your fabulous work. It's been uh, wonderful to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fantastic.